Uh, let's continue. We've been uh, talking about the different kinds of prayer, all kinds of prayer, every kind of prayer. And so far, we've looked at the prayer of asking and receiving. We've looked at uh, the prayer of supplication. We've looked at the prayer of intercession and also thanksgiving. So I just want to add to what we just said uh, about thanksgiving uh, and include praise and worship as a part of thanksgiving in prayer. Okay? Because what are we doing in that? We are affirming the nature of God. Yes, you know, we are waiting for him to do many things for us. Uh, but at the same time, we praise him. We adore him for who he is. And, you know, our faith becomes stronger as we have thanksgiving in our prayer. Okay? So, answers to prayers will, in fact, come faster if I may use that term, when thanksgiving is involved. Otherwise, it will only be God, just give it, do it, you know, have mercy, amen. <laughs> okay, but here we are relating to God, knowing who he is. And so, we are rejoicing in him. While we are asking him, it's not like, oh, I'm desperate and I know he can't do it, but still, if I, if I just pray, he might be able to do it. It doesn't work like that. Instead, when we come with thanksgiving, it's like saying, God, because you are able, I'm asking you. I know you will do it. Okay? So thanksgiving, praise, worship is an integral part of our right praying. So we've uh, seen four categories so far. We can move ahead and look at the next category here, which is the prayer of consecration. Okay, and the classic example of the prayer of consecration is um, that of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we have that passage here from Matthew 26, where you know, Jesus calls unto the Father, uh, and you know, he asks the Father to take away the upcoming trial, but finally he yields to the will of God. He yields to the will of God and says, okay, God, it's not my will, let your will be done. See, overall, we always pray for God's will only to be done. That is the right prayer, isn't it? God, God's will to be accomplished and that is what we must ask for. Some of the things that God wants, very clear. God wants us to worship him, very clear. In scripture, God wants us to be holy, very clear. So there are many things in scripture which are very clear. And then, of course, there are the rhema words of God, you know, the promises that we very specifically receive in our lives. And we know, you know, God wants me to do this. I know God wants me someday to uh, uh, preach or lead worship or uh, have a company. So sometimes we are aware of these very specifics and very clearly we have come to that place of faith knowing this is it. It is in line with God's word. It is a promise from God. No doubts about it. So when you pray, you pray confidently. God, thank you. You know, you said this, it's going to happen. But there are some prayers where we are not sure. Okay. In this case, Jesus knew very well that it is not God's purpose for him to back away from going to the cross. He knew. He knew that it is not God's will. But he was in a place of great pain and distress. And that is why, being a human, he just cried out to God and he said, God, I don't think I can take it. Is there any way you can change your plan? But because Jesus knew that it is not God's purpose, he throws in, but not my will, Lord. Let, it, let yours be done. So sometimes we are in that place where we are not sure. I'm not sure what God, what does God want for me? I'm not clear. Okay. The best thing to do in those moments is to surrender and say, God, okay, you're not giving up, but you're simply saying that whatever I'm thinking, I'm sure you have something better, Lord. I just hand it over to you. So that is the prayer of consecration. That is the prayer of surrender. Okay? Uh, it can also be called 
as the pair of yielding your will lord whatever is your will i will say yes to it okay so what is jesus doing what is consecration consecration is um dedicating oneself so jesus in that moment he just dedicated himself whatever your purpose i will do it that's why it's called consecration so in the same way when we don't know when we are not clear about the purpose of god we just yield but this doesn't mean that i don't do my part to uh, study scriptures so when i have you know something on my heart okay let's say you know god is calling you to a certain kind of business you have never seen people do you know business or let's take for example god is calling you to have an art ministry you have not seen a ministry like that and you are like is it even possible is it even right Uh, as far as god's word is concerned like what is this can i do this i have to do my part of studying about okay is art okay what kind of art is okay what kind of art glorifies god so once i come to a place of understanding okay you know this is fine it is in god's will it's also in god's will for my life because he has given me the skills you know, he has given me the desire i can do this i am clear on these matters then i can just you know pray a prayer of asking and receiving or a prayer of supplication but let's say i have done my due diligence and still i'm not clear that's when this prayer is very much applicable where i say god you know i've tried to understand but i can't understand but at this point whatever you want for me if you want me to do art if you want me to have an art ministry well and good if not you want me to do some other ministry i'm fine i just yield to you i just surrender to you i just dedicate myself to you so that's the meaning of the prayer of consecration at a time when you're not clear not sure uh you just hand it over into god's hands okay so we can pray such prayers and these prayers are very very powerful i've even heard you know when people uh, consecrate or they dedicate themselves uh you could this could even be a prayer of consecration could also be when one uh, is offering themselves to ministry or, or something like that i've heard when people have prayed such prayers uh, sometimes they've like had supernatural experiences because you've just handed yourself over to god you know i consecrate my body i consecrate my eyes to do see what you want me to do i consecrate my hands i consecrate my feet you know when people have prayed prayers like that bondages over their lives have been broken in moments also because what are you doing you're completely giving yourself to god and saying surrender lord all yours and then god is able to work from that place of consecration or dedication so this is the prayer of consecration if you have any questions doubts just you know pop them uh, and i'm here to to pick it up okay so that is about the prayer of consecration google classroom students are you doing okay i know i'm not talking much to you or uh, rather i haven't spoken much today but i just want to know if you are all fine you able to track with me okay yes one person how about the others yes yes okay good good to see some activity on the chat as well so uh, yeah feel free if you have questions please post from time to time i'll look and try to answer your questions here as well okay so prayer of consecration now the next type of prayer is the prayer of agreement okay the prayer of agreement what is this prayer very easy no matthew 18 verse 19 if any two of you agree touching one thing then what did jesus say i'll do it for you if you agree upon something god will do it for us can somebody quickly turn to that scripture and read it matthew chapter 18 and verse 19 wow so that's plain and clear if any two of you agree on earth so it's applicable to us concerning anything so whenever you read this 
whatever you ask anything please know that it should be in the will of god we can't just say oh god give me a helicopter <laughs> and god is like oh, wait a minute <laughs> why are you asking me for anything anything doesn't mean anything like that so it has to be in the will of god okay so whatever anything so here it says i say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask so notice they have agreed and they are asking god god please do this it will be done for them by my father in heaven so no wonder whenever we have these uh, cell groups or you know two by two prayer three people praying together generally they will quote matthew 18 19 god you said in your word if we agree touching any you know touching one thing if we agree upon that um, then you will do it for us you said you will do it for us do it for us yes god has presented his will in the word and he says i will do it for you it's powerful so prayer of agreement is powerful sometimes when we okay go ahead there is a question already okay so see the context there is unity isn't it unity forgiveness isn't it so when there is unity and people agree in prayer jesus is pointing it out to us and saying that it is powerful okay so it's not away from the context of the passage also so when there is unity when there is agreement many things happen okay um and the classic example is the book of acts because after the ascension of jesus what happened the believers were gathered together and you know what term is used quite often when they were praying together one accord they were all together in one accord one accord is not just physical physically being together we can all be here together but if we don't agree you are saying that and somebody else is saying something else and another person saying something else no agreement no one accord then we start praying okay but god is hearing different things from our hearts then what happens is that a prayer of agreement we are all there 15 of us you know are, are there but it's not a prayer of agreement when we come together one more thing is very important agreement one accord so when we are in one accord and then we ask god god says i will do it for you so in the book of acts that is the powerful testimony which the believers had uh, before the holy spirit came down in acts 2 they were in one accord and scripture says and suddenly there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind because they were together in their hearts okay similarly even later on you see when they gathered together you know they prayed together when peter and john uh, were were uh, persecuted even at that time they all came together and they cried out to god together and said god you know you give us boldness we don't want to be stopped by opposition help us give us boldness we pray that more signs more miracles more wonders will be done in the name of jesus so that was the cry of their hearts did it happen yes as you read you know acts 4 acts 5 acts more miracles more signs more boldness you know more volunteers going to different cities it was happening because these were prayers of agreement so prayers of agreement are powerful why do we have you know churches and pastors encouraging okay pray together let us have fasting prayer let us come together or join in small groups because of this prayer of agreement praying in one accord it can release answers from heaven god said i will do it for you okay yes go ahead hmm. yes okay very good question here uh, so yeah we have a question where um, uh, we are asked what if people pray by themselves 
Okay, what if people uh, pray by themselves? Is it not powerful enough? See, when God adds a new revelation, it doesn't mean that we discard the old revelation. Okay, so what is the old revelation we have? I'm simply saying old and new, but you know what I mean. Old revelation is like last two, three chapters. We, we understood that we have to pray. God said, you pray, ask and you will receive. So he's calling us to pray individually. So you build on that. So we are supposed to pray alone also. And there are times when we have to pray in twos and threes also. And again, you know, this, there's no formula to this. That is why I know in scripture, it's very difficult to give a formula and say, every time you have a, you know, whatever, you have a hair loss problem, agree with somebody and pray, it will work out. You know, your hair will start growing. It doesn't happen like that. You can't use the same formula for something. You have to be led by the Spirit. So prayer is about relationship. When I'm walking with the Holy Spirit, maybe I'm praying for a brother who's unwell and the Holy Spirit impresses on my heart strongly. You need a prayer of agreement. I know you are interceding, but you need a prayer of agreement. Agree with that brother or agree with two or three people. In that moment, you join. And also what we notice in scripture is whenever it comes to um, subjects regarding the community or uh, the state or the nation, big regions, it's better for more people to come together. Okay. I'm not saying that the prayer of one person will not be answered because remember when I shared earlier in Ezekiel, God was looking for one man to stand in the gap. A prayer of one individual is very effective, no doubt. But there are certain causes when God's people have to stand together. You cannot see results when only one person prays. Okay. So it also works like that. Okay. So both. Sure. Yes. So we are on the chat. We have a question. Anything meaning in line with God's word? Yes, that's right. Uh, as I explained a little earlier, anything doesn't mean anything randomly, but it means in the will of God. And one more point that I want to share here in the prayer of agreement is the fact that um, it says, if any two of you, don't you think God makes, God has made it so easy for us. If I have to gather a group of 10 people every time, I pray of prayer of agreement, there'll be very few prayers of agreement. But what did Jesus say? Only one more person. So if there's one other person who agrees with you for somebody's healing or for somebody's breakthrough, for somebody's miracle, God says, I'll do it for you. You just need one more person in agreement. And that's why it's also said that, um, you know, when it comes to like uh, um, marriage, right? just a couple, you just need husband and wife. It's so powerful. Only two people agreeing together. But what's the key there? Agreement and the will of God. When you pray in agreement and the will of God, it tends to happen. Okay, so I'm just going to pause for a moment. Okay, so we shall pick up from where we stopped here. Uh, so the prayer of agreement. In fact, uh, in the book of Acts, it says when they had come together and they had prayed, the ground where they uh, stood, right? Where they had prayed, it shook. So it's that powerful when we come together in prayer. So don't make, take any opportunity of agreement carelessly. I know here for us in Bible college, we have those times of prayer, supernatural hour. Uh, it's a privilege. If you have people in agreement praying, never take it lightly because God can do mighty things uh, through those moments of agreement. All right. So prayer of agreement is so powerful. Then the next one here is 
prayer in the spirit prayer in the spirit so prayer in the spirit simply means praying in the holy spirit okay praying in the holy spirit so there are a couple of scriptures that we can go over to understand what this means so praying in the holy spirit um, firstly in first corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2 when one for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to god for no one understands him however in the spirit he speaks mysteries so this category of prayer is special praying in tongues reason being see even the other prayers we are praying to god but this particular prayer very specifically it says that only god understands and it goes directly to god okay so when i'm praying in the spirit this is the advantage which we have that these prayers reach god directly also in the sense that nobody else can understand what we are praying so when i'm praying in the spirit when i'm praying in tongues i have great confidence it's going directly to god god is listening to my prayers and it says he speaks mysteries in the spirit he speaks mysteries so that also reveals to us that when we pray we don't know what we are saying okay but other passages of scripture reveal to us that we are praying in the will of god we are praying in the will of god so what are these mysteries that i'm speaking i don't know but one thing i know i am praying in the will of god so what god wants so whenever we pray in the will of god does that prayer get answered or not always does so when i'm praying in tongues all my prayers are check mark tick 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 yes done 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 so that is the privilege of praying in tongues which is why we say you know pray paul also said i pray more than all of you i pray in the spirit because god gives us that advantage when we pray in the spirit so we are praying to god we are speaking mysteries to god what else so he we have uh, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 15 through 17 which is also given to us in this passage where in verse 15 he says I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. So some people say oh because God has given us uh, the ability to pray in the spirit how about I only pray in the spirit why should I pray in my language but notice Paul says I will pray with the spirit but I will also pray with my understanding. So, when God gives us both the options, there must be a reason why. I need to pray both kinds of prayers. I pray in the spirit. I also pray with my understanding. And verse 16, otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? So, sometimes when we pray, in the spirit you know it uh, it's also thanksgiving we are thanking god we are praising god when we are praying in the spirit okay uh, and in this particular passage the reason uh, you know paul gives them all these inputs is so that they they don't use this prayer language you know as a, um, a language to minister so in a group setting when we speak in tongues, it's important for us to interpret. Otherwise, people will not understand. But in a personal context, if I pray in tongues, it's okay. Why? Because I'm not trying to talk to anybody here. I'm talk talking to God and God already understands what I'm saying. I'm uh, praying uh, the perfect will of God. I'm praying according to his purposes. All right. So that is the advantage of praying in tongues. Again, we are going to study in detail about praying in the spirit a little later. But at this point, if you have any doubts, questions, we can take it up.
Okay, so the question is, if uh, there's nobody to in interpret, as a community, can we pray in tongues? You can, okay, but we have to look at the context. So in 1 Corinthians 14, what Paul says is, if an unbeliever comes in your midst, he will not understand. He will think that, you know, all of you, uh, something is wrong with all of you. Let's say there's no unbeliever over here. Or let me also take it to the extent of saying there is, uh, you know, there are people who all understand what tongues is and they agree. Maybe they don't speak in tongues, but they are open to it. In such a gathering, if you speak in tongues, it's okay. Because you're not offending anybody. Right? Because we all agree that this is beneficial. When in a group setting without interpretation, we are praying in tongues, it's a personal prayer language. So there are different kinds of tongues. Personal prayer language tongues is what is common. All of us have that. So in a group setting like this, if I use that personal prayer language, it's okay because we all know what we're doing. But in a context, let's say uh, a church service, a lot of unbelievers we've invited, they're all sitting in the audience. At that time, if I pray loudly in tongues and they don't understand, it can create some offense to those unbelievers. So in that setting, Paul says, be careful. If you have interpreted, then you say. Otherwise, what you're saying, you can't understand. You know, how will they understand? And only if we understand, we are built up or edified. So speak words of understanding in a setting where there are unbelievers. The, is that clear? Okay, great. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so if somebody cannot, does not have the gift of tongues, uh, then what we should tell them is they have to pray for tongues. Okay, uh, they need to desire the gift of tongues. The reason I'm saying this is, um, you see, when we study what Paul, Paul says, he says, earnestly uh, desire, uh, earnestly, one second, I'll just read it out for us. Let me make it easy. Okay, so uh, after like the end of, um, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, he encourages all believers about the gifts of the Spirit. He tells them, you know, these are all, he lists it out and all that. Then he goes on to 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, you should, you should have love because love is the greatest. Okay, again, he is not discrediting the gifts because he only spoke about the gifts. Now he's talking about love. He simply means use the gifts in love. Okay, don't discard the gifts. Then he goes on to chapter 14. The first thing in that chapter 14, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So one quick thing that I want to say here is, see, he says, pursue love to how many people? All the people. So he's saying, desire spiritual gifts to how many people? So if God is not going to give, why to desire? Isn't it? The reason God, is, God wants to give is why he's saying you pursue it or you desire it. So everybody can desire to have tongues. So when somebody cannot speak in tongues, this is what we would say. All the gifts of the Spirit are available for everybody. We'll study about these things okay, later on. So tongues is also included in it. So if, I, if somebody in our group cannot speak in tongues, I mean, don't shame them. Don't put pressure on them that you have to. Because it's their journey with God. We don't do it like that. But at the same time, we can encourage them and say, okay, if you can't speak and if you really want to speak, you pray, brother, you ask God, you desire it, God will give it to you. 
Is that fine? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, all right. So for the benefit of the Google Classroom students here, yeah, I'll just um, share you know, the questions that are being asked. One is, so praying in the spirit, uh, is it only praying in tongues? For that, I said yes. And the next question is, uh, praying in tongues, does it does only God understand or do the angels also understand? Okay, so our answer to this is, see, first of all, I don't understand tongues, so it's very difficult for me to explain what, uh, you know, this would be like. But there are, you know, he who prays in tongues, he speaks mysteries, but uh, in, um, I think, 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if you speak in the language of angels, okay, I don't know if it's the same language or different, different languages. What if you go up to heaven there and you figure out, oh my goodness, I have 200 languages. So if I'm speaking in one particular language, maybe one angel doesn't understand another angel. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so it could be that some angels understand, but I have a feeling that it's a unique language which only God can understand. Okay, so that's my, there's no scripture, Bible verse, don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, Any anything else? Okay, you can think, there are questions here. Let me take this up. Uh, so Google Classroom, as it's written in the Bible, some can interpret tongues. Is it something anyone can do in time or is it a gift in itself? Okay, so uh, Krishna, what I would say is, this is a gift of the Holy Spirit, interpretation of tongues, because it is listed in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. So as much as tongues is a gift of uh, the Holy Spirit, interpretation of tongues is also a gift of the Holy Spirit. When does it operate? Obviously, it is needed when somebody is speaking in tongues. So I don't know. Somehow, God lets it operate at that time. So the timing is also correct. Okay. So that how, that's how it happens. So the answer to your question is, yes. Is it something anyone can do it in the time? Or, yeah, people are able to do it in that time when it is required. That, that gift operates in that time. Okay, I hope uh, that answers your question. The next question is, can Holy Spirit hint us as to what we are praying for while praying in tongues? Okay, great. Very good question. Can Holy Spirit give us a hint? Again, there is no scripture for this, but by observation, a lot of people say that when they pray in tongues, they kind of have an idea of what they're talking about. Okay, maybe after you have prayed in tongues, the Holy Spirit releases the knowledge into our you know, faculties. So people say that also, that you sometimes have an idea of what you were actually praying for. Okay, so yes, that is a possibility. Very good questions. I feel like we should just, you know, stay in this subject, but we have to move on. Any more questions? Okay, go ahead. Hmm. Okay. Great. So I told you there are different categories of tongues, right? Uh, so one is like you speak in tongues, which only God understands. Okay. And sometimes another gift of the Holy Spirit is operational, which is the interpretation of tongues. Now the other person who's interpreting, they may actually not understand. You know what I mean? But they're operating by the Holy Spirit. So these words are coming out of their mouth not because they're understanding it, but because the Holy Spirit is giving them those words. So that's, that's how I think it works. And I also want to say that not that tongues cannot be understood by people, because there's another category of tongues, which is called as a sign, tongues as a sign. If you go to Acts chapter 2, you remember, people were all gathered and they all started praising God, filled with the Holy Spirit. 
there were people from at least 15 regions who had gathered at that time. Bible says they were all able to hear what they were saying in their own language. Got it? So tongues can be heavenly language. Tongues can be human language. I don't know. When I am praying, I don't know what I'm saying. I could be speaking like, you know, maybe some Kazakh or Russian. Or it could be. I could be speaking a human language. Or I could be speaking a heavenly language. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, only God understands. That's right. But there are times when we may speak human languages. But that category of tongues is known as sign to the unbeliever. So when I speak that, he is able to hear in his own language, you know, the mighty works of God. So it's it's amazing. Yeah, so there, there are all these categories of tongues. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, so we shall move forward then. Okay, so this was about prayer in the spirit. Uh, next is prayer of repentance and confession. Okay, prayer of repentance and confession. Quite easy for us to understand. So the passage given here is 1 John 1, 7 through 8. And we will look at it. Here we are told to come before God and confess. You know, if there is anything that the Holy Spirit is convicting us about. Uh, and so, uh, you know, John writes here, he says, um, we have the blood of Jesus. In verse 7, the last portion, he says the blood of Jesus, Christ is able to cleanse us. It cleanses us from sin. So what should we do? Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This prayer of repentance, once again, it can be personal or it can be as a group. So what, do we, what are we supposed to do in repentance? Holy Spirit, one of the functions of the Holy Spirit is he will convict us or he will give us the impression in our hearts. Hey, what you said is not correct or what you did is not correct. You know, your attitude was not correct. Uh, this is not glorifying God. So Holy Spirit, he tells us, he convicts us about righteousness, sin and judgment. So my spirit is able to pick it up. So when I realize what I did is not correct in the sight of God, what should I do? I need to confess. That's what John, Apostle John is saying. He's saying, if we know that what we have done is not correct, don't keep it inside you. In the book of Psalms, it says, you know, I kept it within myself and, you know, my bones were, were, it began to rot or something like that. It says, it's not good to keep our sin in our hearts and pretend like, oh, nothing is wrong. I'm okay. I'm okay. It's not helpful. It's not helpful for us. You know, it's not helpful for anybody. So when we recognize there is sin, this is not correct. Apostle John says, don't deceive yourself. Don't say, I don't have sin. Don't deceive yourself. Truth is not in you. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He earlier said, blood of Jesus has been provided to cleanse you, to clean you. If there is something which is sin, you just confess it. Only then God can clean us up. Only then, you know, we can, you know how David, David sinned against God. He committed adultery before God. But he goes again, Psalm 51, when you read, you know, what, a, what a broken and a contrite heart before God. And he says, you know, God, you search my heart. You, know, you cleanse me, Lord. You know, what I did is not correct. God is looking for that kind of an attitude. So sometimes those are those, pray we have those prayers. Where maybe we have done something which is not pleasing to God. Repentance. God, forgive me. I'm sorry. I want to change. But for that, we have to say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. This went wrong. But instead, if we keep it in ourselves, what does John say? You are deceiving yourself. 
you're lying to yourself that everything is okay. So we also have this category of prayers of repentance. Is it applicable in a community setting? It is, isn't it? You remember Jonah? God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, even to Tarshish. First of all, he confesses like, oh God, I made a mistake, sorry. Repentance. But when he comes and preaches to the people of Nineveh, they're very sinful people. He never expected them to repent. But what happened? They put on, you know, sackcloth, ashes. What are they doing as a community? They're saying, God, we are sorry. We are so sorry. We heard your message. We are making a U-turn. That is what God expects. So there can be prayer of repentance, confession, you know, to God. Who should I confess? By the way, see, it, there is another place where it says confess to one, one another. But here it says confess to God. We can directly confess to God. Sometimes, you know, sins are such that there may be a need to confess to another elder or spiritual elder or somebody with maturity. You know, don't go around confessing to everybody your sins. That's a very foolish thing to do. But there are there is a context where it is necessary, you know, for, for somebody to confide and confess to a more mature, um, trustworthy person when it helps us to come out of that situation. Okay, so in those uh, situations, you tell somebody. But otherwise, the normal is you confess to God. So regular uh, things, just go ahead, confess to God, and we have a promise from God's word which says, He will forgive us, right? And uh, what else does it say? Just to forgive us our sins. Second, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so that's very encouraging. Uh, and we can take that step of confessing to God. Okay, moving on here. Uh, the next one is the prayer of unburdening. Okay, very interesting. Prayer of unburdening. What is that? Prayer of unburdening is simply pouring out your heart before the Lord. Again, I go back to Hannah's prayer. She carried, she carried supplication right, in her prayer, but also from the way it is described, we know she was pouring out her heart, all her, you know, everything that's bottled up within her, she was just releasing it to God and saying, God, you know, you, you are there, you will help me. So this is so helpful. You know, we praise God for giving us uh, an opportunity like this. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Because God cares for us, we can share. Whatever we are going through, we can, we can put it out to God there and say, God, please help me. You know, this is all going on in my life. Sometimes our prayers may not even be so structured when we are in a tough situation, okay? And in those moments, this prayer of unburdening and praying in the spirit may be the only way words are coming out of our mouths because we don't know what else to say. We're just pouring out. Whatever is coming into our hearts, we are pouring it out. But God accepts it. So there is a prayer of unburdening where we are just pouring our hearts out. Psalm 62 and verse 8 has been given here. It says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Okay, so we can do that. We can spend time in his presence and we can pour out our hearts. So the next one here is prayer of faith for healing. Faith for healing. So in the book of James, James says, if there's anyone who is sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them come and do what? Anoint with oil uh, and uh, pray a prayer of faith. Let me quickly read. Yeah. He, I, verse 14, James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay? So we are following all these things, anointing with oil, uh, praying in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So what kind of prayer do I pray? 
over the sick here. This is like I gave you the answer and I'm asking the question. So you should tell me the answer. Prayer of faith. So when I'm praying for the sick, I have to pray a prayer of faith. Then what will happen? They will be healed. So the prayer of faith is another category where we carry faith in our hearts and we minister it to people. Now, do people get healed because they come with faith? True. But sometimes, even if the people don't have faith, if I have faith and I pray the prayer of faith, healing can take place. Okay, so there's another uh, uh, example in your notes. This is of Paul. He's on a, an island that he prays for a man who was sick. And immediately, you know, that, that man was healed. How did he minister faith? So we minister through faith. So especially ministering and ministering healing, the kind of prayers which we need to pray are prayers of faith. So when I pray in faith, in the name of Jesus, it happens. So I remember, I'm going to close the class with this, uh, uh, you know, one small testimony that I recall whenever I think of the prayer of faith. And then we'll pick up the rest of the categories of prayer later. Uh, so this was one incident where uh, there was a girl who had come uh, and uh, she came and she asked for prayer. Okay. So I at first I didn't think of it as much. I thought, okay, your prayer. Then she was wearing a jacket. She just said, Pastor, give me your hand and uh, touch here. So when I touched, there was like a huge bulge, like a stony bulge on her hand there. So that's when I was like, okay, uh, what do I do now? She's asking me to pray and she's like, Pastor, pray that this will disappear. So then I just depended on the Holy Spirit and said, God, all things are possible by you. You are a healer. I prayed a prayer of faith. In faith, I prayed, okay, I command the swelling in the name of Jesus be gone. Okay, so I prayed the prayer of faith and I gave it into God's hands. Uh, and then after that, I started, sometimes it's good to talk about the condition after you pray because when they're explaining, the faith you have also might just fly away, right? So after praying, that's when I said, okay, tell me more, you know, what happened? So she's saying, no, the swelling is there, it's hard, it's bony, and they've taken a biopsy. I will get the reports. I really don't know. My parents live in another city, this and that. So I was like, okay, fine. Anyway, by faith. We have prayed uh, with the authority in the name of Jesus. I believe God will do a miracle for you. Let me know what happens. She came back in two weeks. She's like, Pastor, put your hand there. It went. It just went. Right? So they took it for biopsy and they were trying to check all these weeks and months because it was not going. But she said, after you prayed, every day I was feeling it little by little, little by little. It just became smaller, 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 smaller. It just, it's gone. And the doctors are like, what is the need for biopsy now? It's gone, right? So I still am so amazed because it's about the word of God. You know, I'm not trying to say that, oh, I prayed or whatever. Anybody who prays, honestly, that was the first time I saw a miracle like that take place. You know, in, in my experience that a swelling just disappeared. Okay. So all I'm saying is when you pray a prayer of faith, God Heals. And here in this passage, what, is, um, what does it say? You pray a prayer of faith and it will do what? It will heal the sick. Okay. Let me read it for us. Yeah. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. So when we minister, especially when you're praying for somebody for healing, pray a prayer of faith. Okay, so that's what the Bible says. You, you pray by faith. You believe, God, you can do it. Whatever it is, you can do it. Okay, and you see God working it out in that person's life also. So at this point, we are going to stop. We'll pick up with uh, the other types of prayer in the next class and also study about the prayer of asking and receiving in detail. So let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time.
in your presence, in your word, and for all that, Lord, you are helping us learn. Lord, help us, O oh God, to have a strong foundation in prayer and see mighty things accomplished for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, online students, too. I'll meet you in the next class. Bye for now. Okay.